The Decalvinizing of Romans Chapter 9, Part 2. Hi, welcome to today's little lesson. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope before you watch this lesson that you watched Part 1 of Decalvinizing Romans Chapter 9 because we're going to build in this little lesson on the foundation we built on the last little lesson. It is not the end of the world, of course, if you watch this one without watching that one, but I would feel so much better if you would watch that one first, because we covered Romans 9, verses 1 through 13, or maybe verse 12. I kind of stumbled a little bit on verse 13, um, but we're going to start today in right around verse 14 and build on the foundation, okay? And uh, the overall foundation of all of this is that any scripture that we read in the New Testament must be read within the context of it, its immediate context, the verses around it. If you're looking at one verse, look at the verses before and after in the context of the chapter and the entire book and, and the entire New Testament. Uh, it all has to harmonize. And, and if you read, if, if you can, if you if arrive at a conclusion that is contradicted by scores of other scriptures, guess what? The conclusion is wrong. And you need to go back to the drawing board and keep working to try to bring harmony so you have a better balance. And you say, well, I, I just can't get these things to reconcile. Well, it's either beyond your understanding, it might, it might be, right? Uh, or it could be beyond all our understanding. It's a bit of a mystery. That's always a possibility. That two things that we think can't both be true, somehow, in the world, in God's world, that they're both true. Because, you know, my peanut brain and your peanut brain are nothing compared to God's brain. He knows everything, okay? All right. Okay, so... <clears throat> The point that Paul had made, and we were we're building on this, is is that um, just because you're a descendant of Israel doesn't mean a physical descendant of Israel doesn't mean that you are actually a descendant of Israel. And you know, he, we know, of course that those of us who are Gentiles, who have no physical lineage that can be traced back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when we get in Christ, who he was a descendant of Jacob and Isaac and Abraham, um, and we become part of Abraham's seed or Abraham's descendants, and that's part of the mystery that's revealed in the New Testament. When God showed Abram the stars of the heavens, and he said, that so shall your descendants be. And he said, they'll be like the sand on the seashore and the dust of the earth. You know, Abram didn't know it, you know, but we know it now, who've read the New Testament. We're, we're, we're one of those descendants. We are some of those descendants, the Gentiles, grafted in. All right. And so he's making his case here that, you know, that there's precedent for that, that just because you're a physical descendant doesn't mean the blessing comes to you automatically because your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God made choices each generation that eliminated someone and that set somebody else up. Abraham had Ishmael and Isaac. God said to Isaac, your descendants will be named. Not through Ishmael. It's God's choice. He's allowed to make any choice he wants to. Didn't say God predestined Ishmael to be damned and Isaac to be saved. That's not even under in the radar here at all. And then a after Isaac, you know, God made a choice when Rebecca was had twins, Jacob and Esau, and God said. The older will serve the, uh, the 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 older will serve the younger, and so God reversed the order. And that doesn't seem right, does it? I mean, come on, the firstborn gets the blessing. Not if God decides otherwise. Does that mean that God predestined, um, you know, Jacob to be saved and Esau to be damned? Nowhere, 
nowhere in at anything we're reading or anything in the Bible along those lines. That's not the point. That's not, Paul's not talking here about, you know, why are some people saved and other people not saved? That's not what he's talking about. Uh, actually, he is talking about that, but he, he's, he, and we'll see that, but he's not saying anywhere that it all hinges on God selecting individuals. No, God is dealing with individuals, but he's also dealing with groups that consist of you know, groups of individuals, and he's going to develop that as we keep reading here. So, naturally, you'd think, well, you know, hey, God's making these choices for the lineage of blessing. Verse number 14 of Romans 9, What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. Paul responds, for he says to Moses, quote, this is what God said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. Well, you notice those are two, two nice things. I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. God can show mercy and compassion on whoever he wants to. We, can, we, we can't dictate that or get upset. But that's exactly what Paul was addressing because that's what exactly what was going on. Jews, who by this time apparently were in the minority of the redeemed of the church, are saying, what's going on? All these Gentiles, you're telling us, are, you know, God's accepting them, forgiving them, cleansing them, and now they're making up more and more the majority of the church and the... Jewish percentage is like getting smaller by comparison. We don't like the idea that God's having mercy or compassion on Gentiles. God will have mercy on whomever he wants, and he'll have compassion on whoever he wants, and it's none of your business. Now, there is the other side of the coin, of course, but Paul just states it again. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. That's the whole big deal. God, he had great mercy on Jews, work, dealt work with them, you know, for centuries, generations, generations, trying to redeem people, you know, sending them prophets, doing miracles, sending them Messiah, anointing apostles to try to reach these Jewish people, you know, hard-hearted people. Some respond, many don't. And so God says, I'm going to have some mercy on some Gentiles now. We're going to get people in this banquet one way or the other. We go to the highways and the byways because the ones who were invited refused the invitation. Paul or Jesus told a parable about that one time, the parable you know, of the, of the king who's having the wedding feast for his son. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, now here's a quote, to Pharaoh from God, for this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, so that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. Now that actually, Calvinists use that to support their doctrine, you know, because God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And let's, let's read the next verse. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. But Paul never said, God arbitrarily, without any reason, hardens some and has mercy on others. That's nowhere on the radar in what we just read. Nowhere whatsoever. If you read the story of, of Pharaoh, you know, he, he hardened his heart progressively, and then the Bible starts saying God hardened his heart. And it's very biblical and very scriptural that God very well may, if he so desires, because he, he, has, he has mercy on whom he has mercy, and he hardens whom he hearts, but God may harden those further as an act of judgment on those who harden their hearts against him. That is, people that reject him, God makes it a little bit harder for them to receive him. Not impossible. And, and, and that's, Paul, that's part of Paul's bigger point here, that, that these Jews have rejected the Messiah. God's actively hardened them to a degree, not, you know, not to an you know, infinite degree. We'll see that. So God raised up Pharaoh. Now listen to this. This is not a Calvinistic idea. 
that his name might be proclaimed throughout the earth. God wanted to do something that would get the attention of the whole earth when he judged Egypt and delivered Israel. Why? Because he's trying not just to make himself famous. What does God need to be famous for? You know, any more famous than he already is. People can look around and see his creation, right? They can just, it's jaw-dropping stuff that God's doing millions of times before everybody every day. And God goes to extraordinary lengths to reach them even further by doing these great miracles and plagues in Egypt to deliver a people of Israel. It should have got the attention of the whole world. And they should have said, you know what? I think we ought to get to know that, God. Let's head over there to the promised land and hang out with those people. Because God's over there doing something with those people. And God was advertising that the whole world, because God loves the whole world. God wants all people to come to, 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 come to repentance and the knowledge of the truth. God's not willing that any should perish. And, you know, any in past history, any currently right now, any in future. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. That stands against the Calvinistic idea of the limited atonement, the unconditional election, you know. In this famous chapter that, that Calvinists run to for their support. And yes, God did harden an individual's heart, and God may harden and does harden individual hearts today. That's New Testament. You know, we read about the, in, in Thessalonians, in the end times, God will send upon these people a deluding influence that they might believe what is false. Why? Because they already did not receive the love of the truth and they rejected it. So God kind of furthers their deception. In fact, in that case, it looks like it's deception beyond any hope of redemption because of what they rejected. Yeah. So that, 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 that's a reality. Nobody can argue with that, that God may harden individuals, but not arbitrarily. And, and God may, may, may have mercy and compassion on those uh, on people he desires, but not arbitrarily, because God's just and fair. Even, when, even in him choosing Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, who was he thinking of? Yeah, God was working his plan of redemption to bring Jesus through these guys. And he was thinking of you and me. <laughs> and thank goodness you didn't harden your heart, and so God didn't harden it further. God had mercy and compassion on you. See, he says, you know, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. If you keep reading in Romans, and you get to chapter 11, you know, Paul says, God has shut up all in disobedience, Jew and Gentile, that he might show mercy to all. And that's, within that is the big picture and the secondary picture as well. God's not just showing mercy to Jews, he's showing mercy to Gentiles. And that's what's going on in Romans chapter 9. So he has mercy on whom he has mercy. He has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. But he never said arbitrarily. You will say to me then, verse number 19, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? Well, God finds fault with people, and then he they reap what they sow, and, and it could result in a judgment of him further hardening their hearts that they already hardened. And of course, God finds fault with them. Um, you know, they are to blame. He wouldn't blame them if they weren't blameworthy, because that's not how God is. But the question is, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who is this as well? So the first answer is, on the contrary, who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God. You know, you're, you're judging God now. You're on dangerous ground there. The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? And you can't argue with that logic or you can't argue with the point either. The potter can do whatever he wants. He can make a, you know, a, a, a beautiful uh, vase that's for some honorable use and he can make a little you know, cup that's just a pick up the slop or whatever. You know, that, that's, that's his decision. So 
By the same token, God, the creator, the maker of all people, can do whatever he wants. But he's not saying that God, like a potter, arbitrarily decides, I'm making this vessel for, you know, for an honorable use. I'm going to save these ones. I'm going to make this individual, you know, create them to send them to hell. And that's my purpose. That is not, not said here. Because look at the very next verse. This is uh, verse number 22. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and make his power known? So here is God. He has an inclination to judge sin by pouring out his wrath. But he doesn't. He shows mercy to them. He endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Now, the Calvinists jump on that word prepared, you know, and again, if that was the only verse in the Bible, I might agree with them, but you know, it's not the only verse in the Bible. We got the whole Bible and there's no evidence that God creates people for, to send them to hell, creates them with the express purpose of them, you know, sinning. And so he can pour out his wrath upon them. No, God desires all people to be saved. God desires all people to repent. That's in your Bible. Okay, so this is an indication of God's mercy. He showed patience towards people who deserved wrath. And when it says they were prepared for destruction, it doesn't mean they were divinely prepared for destruction. It's more of a they had prepared themselves for destruction, but God was withholding his wrath and showing patience. And, he, you know, but there was a, a conflict within God's being. You know, should I show mercy? Should I not show mercy? I, I'd like to pour out my wrath. I'd like to show my power here. But for, on these vessels that deserve wrath. I mean, they're just ripe, prepared. They're ready for destruction. I didn't prepare them. They're ready for that. And he did it to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he also called, not from among the Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles. And so you can look at it different ways. Um, you could look at it as the, 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 the first group that he's talking about, the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, are either the Jews or the Gentiles. There's no other, no other possibility. Well, the Jews certainly deserved it, right? And they got it. If you read the history in the Old Testament, at times they got it, but still God always preserved a remnant and kept trying to work with them and work with the descendants and you know, bring some redemption. Uh, and and he, and and he 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 could have wiped them out, but he never he never did. And uh, and and by the same token, the Gentiles deserved God's wrath for their transgressing their own consciences, for their wickedness, and for their ignoring His power in creation, His revelation. They should have fallen on their faces and said, "God, reveal yourself to me. I'm going to serve you, and I'm going to listen to that inward voice from now on." But they didn't. They deserved wrath. But God showed patience, actually, to both groups. And you can debate as to which group Paul is talking about here. But he showed mercy on people that deserved destruction. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy. Again, Calvinist love, which he prepared beforehand for glory. But again, and that, if that was the only verse in the Bible, I might agree with them. But it's not the only verse in the Bible. Even us, he, whom he also called, not from among the Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles. So the people to whom he was, you know, the, the, the vessels of mercy were both Jew and Gentile. And that's the whole point, isn't it? That God can have mercy on Gentiles if he wants to have mercy on Gentiles. And if he wants to, he can harden Jews who harden their hearts themselves first. He has that right. And just because they're descendants of Isaac or Abraham or Jacob, that's no guarantee. And that's proven by their own history that God makes choices that have nothing to do with, you know, humans are not dictating it. God makes sovereign choices, not about who's saved and damned, 
In this case, who is the, the lineage that brings the Messiah? And he's God's, and it's all so God can reach Jew and Gentile who open their hearts, who yield to his drawing. That's if you take the context of all of Romans 9. Keep reading. Oh, the wisdom in the, of God who has shut up all in disobedience that he might show mercy to all. Romans 11, I think it's verse number 32. So then the, a lot of the rest of this, chapter 9, Paul takes scriptural proof to show the Jews that in their scriptures it was foretold that Gentiles would be saved. And they had no excuse to think that Gentiles would be excluded from you know, the redemption that would be through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the seed, Christ. So verse number 25, and he says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in that place, in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Well, that has to be talking about Gentiles. And it was. So there, God foretold through the Jewish scriptures that Gentiles would be coming into the fold. Now, God also foretold that there would be uh, a rejection among the Jews because part of the argument against Paul's gospel was, hey, if, you're, if your message was true, the Jews would be accepting it, but the majority of Jews have rejected it. Well, that was foretold too in the Jewish scriptures. Romans 9.27 now Paul writes, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. So we just talked about the Gentiles. And about Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. So God foretold of the rejection by the Jews of the Messiah. Just as Isaiah foretold and here's another quote from Isaiah. Unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and we would have resembled Gomorrah. That is, God had more mercy on us than he had on Sodom and Gomorrah because God has mercy on whom he has mercy. And he shows compassion on whom he shows compassion. And he showed a lot of mercy and compassion to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because if he hadn't, they'd be like Sodom and Gomorrah, which got no mercy except for Lot and his daughters who got out. Now here comes this kind of the summary of chapter 9. What shall we say then? Here's a kind of a summarizing inclusion. The ge that Gentiles, see the whole thing is still, it's, it's not individuals who are, you know, why some are saved and why or not. The question is, how, why are most Jews rejecting Paul's gospel and why are Gentiles embracing it, and can Gentiles even be saved? What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. That's the big grand objection of the Jews of Paul's day. We don't believe Gentiles can be saved, and, and Paul says, oh yes, they can, and they're made righteous by their faith. Not just legally righteous, they become practically righteous. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, that is, you're trying to get righteous, not by faith, but by keep, keeping the commandments and falling far short of it. You, you, you know, you're not... A, getting righteous. All you're doing is getting condemned by the law that you keep breaking. Pursuing a law of righteousness did not arrive at that law. They, 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 they didn't keep it. They, they didn't meet the standard of law. Why? Why didn't they meet the standard of law? Because they didn't pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. Again, this is a whole other subject, really, but the righteousness that stems from faith is an actual righteousness. We don't, uh, you know, we, we don't nullify the law through faith. Paul said earlier, we establish the law. Righteousness, true holiness and obedience stems from faith. That was the whole reason Paul was ministering to the Gentiles, was to bring about, he said in Romans 1 and Romans 15, the obedience of faith among the Gentiles. Because uh, Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Which, what's the stumbling stone? Jesus. Just as is written, 
also foretold in the Jewish writings. Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling and a, a, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. See, so it wasn't that God intended for them to stumble and be offended. That was the result. God laid in Zion the stone, not wanting them to stumble, not wanting to offend them, because the next clause says, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Unfortunately, you didn't receive him. You were offended. You stumbled. If you would have believed, you wouldn't have been let down. You wouldn't have been disappointed. You'd have had, you'd have had the adoption of sons. You'd have all these things that the Gentiles are now experiencing the blessing of. You didn't get it. because You stumbled over the stumbling block. I lay in Zion, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. So we'll read one more, a couple more verses in Romans 10 as we wind this down, just to show you the whole context of all Romans chapter 9. Not one single word about God predestining some to be saved and some to be damned, and that's why some are saved and some are damned. Just the exact opposite of that. Rather, that it all comes down to the condition of hearts. Brethren, my desire, my heart's desire, and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. See, Paul wasn't a Calvinist. If he's a Calvinist, he would he would said, "Well, I'm not praying for them to be saved because I know God's predestined some to be saved and some to be damned. So my prayers don't make any difference." No, I'm praying to God for for all of the Jewish Jews to, for their for them to be saved because I know it's God's will. To them belongs the adoption as sons. He said earlier in Romans chapter nine, "For I testified about them that they have a zeal for God." but not in accordance with knowledge. The problem is not that they um, aren't predestined to be saved. The problem is that they have, a, they, they have insufficient knowledge, which is the real reason is because they don't have faith. But For not knowing about God's righteousness, that is, the righteousness that comes from faith. God puts his righteousness into people who believe because he comes to live in them by the Holy Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and that is stems from God in us, His righteousness flowing out of us. That's God's righteousness. Not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own. Again, talking about Jews, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. And then we come to this very famous verse. I'll close on this, verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, he didn't say Christ is the end of righteousness. <laughs> Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes, because everyone who believes, Christ comes to live inside of them, and they get God's righteousness percolating up inside of them. And now they want to do right, they're empowered to, to obey God, and they have an inclination to, to, to obey God. Their hearts have been changed. And all those Gentiles putting the Jews to shame because they've got God's righteousness. They've got the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the gentleness, the faithfulness, and the self-control stemming from the Holy Spirit inside of them. And all those pathetic Jews who rejected Jesus and they're still, they're just trying to get to heaven by being good enough. And they're falling so far short of what the law of Moses requires. They're not living up to the standard and all they're getting is condemned and a guaranteed place in hell. And God's offering the free gift. Believe in Jesus, and I'll fill you with the fruit of my righteousness. I'll forgive all your sins, Jew or Gentile. That's the deal. But when you try to establish your own righteousness apart from Christ, you'll be disappointed in the end. And, and all along the way, you'll be disappointed. Okay? Okay, so I've just hopefully successfully decalvinized Romans chapter 9. And I could actually do a more thorough job, I suppose, if we went through Romans, the first eight chapters, and the last uh, six chapters. You know, it's all there. You can read it yourself, okay? But once you have this basic framework, then you can begin to read it in that context. Don't be a Bible baby. Fixated on one scripture or even one chapter. some awareness of the whole Bible. Okay? All right. Hey, if you've never been to heavensfamily.org, check 
it out. Heaven, the letter S, the word family. You can get involved in obeying Jesus to serve the least of these around the world. Till next time, may the Lord continue to bless you.